Gig Gab, the Working Musicians Podcast, episode 178 for Monday, August 20th, 2018. Folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the podcast by, for, and about working musicians here at GigGabPodcast.com. And here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. Out in Las Gatas, California, it's Paul Kent. How you doing? How's the uh, shoulder for everybody that listened <laughs> last week? Mr. Kent, how's that doing? Shoulders healing, ego still a little bit under the weather, though. Got to tell you, <laughs> my buddy Scott. I, 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 I'm going to talk about the gigs that I did, but you know, at the first gig that we did on Wednesday, as I get on stage, somebody had drawn a little chalk figure outline of me. I and, shared that <laughs> with all of our listeners on. Yeah, on, thank, uh, thanks Facebook for doing there. that, Dave. You're welcome. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so you know, the ribbing continued a little bit, but I don't know what the heck. You know, shared crisis brings us together a little bit. So, um, yeah, but, but couple- you're the only one that had the crisis. The rest of them just had uh, an event that they got to watch. That's it. Well, yeah, we shared the moment. Everybody yes. gets to take away what they need from it. The <laughs> the other guys get a, a moment to tease me for a while. Um, the shoulder is actually um, it actually hurts, and I. Like I said, we just finished five in a row, so I don't know if it's now a repetitive use injury or, oh, <laughs> or if yeah. actually I did something, I'll tweaked it a little bit worse, but it definitely, it's hurting pretty good. So I should probably go get it checked out. I still can lift it, so I don't think it's a tor- torn rotator or, or dislocated, but the, you know, the pain at certain angles is is pretty acute. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I hope that, I hope that gets better for you, man. That sucks. Yeah. I, yeah. Thanks. I, um, I had a, a la- you know, last minute gigs are an interesting thing. Uh, and I had truly not just a, a last minute gig, but a last minute gig with a, a band or group that I had not played with in a while at, with no opportunity for preparation or rehearsal. So on Wednesday, I got a call or a text or whatever from Amanda Dane, who I've done a lot of gigs with, uh, but we haven't played together. It's probably been six months and uh, just schedules haven't matched up or whatever. And there was a, a new a new club uh, or a, a new venue opening in in the location of an old venue. This place called Thompson's Second Alarm just opened um, in a place where a club. I think it closed long before we ever started this podcast. It was called Kelly's Row in in Dover, New Hampshire, and I played there probably more than any other venue in this area. And then they had a very unfortunate flooding incident a number of years ago where they just had to shut the place down immediately and didn't have any insurance coverage for whatever that was. And that was it that that shut them down. We were supposed to I think we were the first canceled band. We were supposed to play there the day after the flood. And so obviously that that didn't happen as fling. Yeah, we were supposed to play there. And uh, and so it was great. Like, I I think there was a a set of owners that, that were in there in between. These folks that are there now who own a restaurant upstairs from the place. So I, I think they will be able to make it work quite well. In fact, what's the place like? Um, it's a restaurant with a stage. So uh, upscale restaurant, family restaurant. It it was a bar and grill kind of place, you know, an Irish bar and grill sort of thing. Um, not uh, uh, upscale is the, the wrong word, but but it's but upscale bar and grill might be the right word right pub you know, a pub definitely a pub yes exactly Got yep. it. and it still sort of has that vibe it's it it felt a little nicer in there the layout was mostly the same but uh felt a little nicer in there than it was when it was Kelly's and they you know they definitely did some work to spruce it up the stage was in the same spot which was handy because it's a weird room there's a it's a it's a great looking room it's uh there's brick along one side and glass uh, almost a full glass wall directly across from the stage. So uh, so that makes sound interesting when you get above a certain decibel level because you get all these weird reflections. And is it bands or is it you know acoustic music? So I've played there with both uh, over the years. This the other night was me, Amanda and Jamie playing, uh, Jamie Bradley playing bass. Uh, she was playing guitar and I paid, played uh, pitch slap. So this was very much, a, you know, an amplified acoustic gig is is mm-hmm. what I would call this. And uh, so we didn't have to deal too much with the sound. I did remember that there was like this 220 hertz thing, like this low A that would just ring in that room. But that was easy because I just tuned it out and we were done. But um, but it it was, um, it, you know, you know, it was nice to get back into this room and it was nice to play. 
the gig came together very quickly. We arrived with just enough time to get set up and, you know, start without being called late, even though we were probably, you know, five minutes late to get started or whatever, but that they were fine with it. And it was their first night. It was their the, the club's soft opening. So it was literally the first time they had patrons in there um, and running things. And it went amazingly well for, for them and for us. But it was one of those cool things where, you know, you're, we were playing these songs and, and the three of us had played together before in this way, but it, it had been several years, I think, since it was the three of us, Jamie had played some with Amanda since then I had played some with, with Amanda since then, of course. And, uh, but it was the first time the three of us were, were together. And then Jamie and I have done gigs cause he's often the bass player in uh, the Madhouse band, which is starting up again, of course, now that the fall is almost here. And uh, so it was really interesting having, these, you know, shared experiences, but no recent history with any one of us together and, you know, kind of simultaneously feeling each other out on stage, especially for things like harmonies and grooves. Right. But but also, you know, getting into those and remembering, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like I remember how these shoes feel, even though it's mm -hmm. been a while since I've worn them, you know, like that, that kind of thing. And uh, and we had some we I, I mean, I, I suppose there were some clams here and there, of course. But we had some really nice, you know, almost surprise moments where you know, three part harmonies just kept locking in left and right. And I was like, oh, yeah, right. This is awesome. And, the, you mm -hmm. know, the crowd was like, wow, you guys are amazing. How well rehearsed are you? We're like, so that's an interesting question. <laughs> you know, the next song will be. Um, <laughs> what, I would just say, what do you think? <laughs> what do you think? Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You never really want to tell them how under rehearsed you are. But, but that's the thing is we weren't really. Uh, under rehearsed is it had just been a while we, shake the rust off. We had to shake some of the rust off and, and uh, you know, it was interesting because Jamie and I both had, had sort of figured out how to sing with Amanda with just two, you, you know, with just two voices, hers and, and either his or, or mine. And it had, and we had figured out how to sing together since the last time we had played with Amanda uh, together and it was really kind of interesting because we could let her sort of move around and the two of us could lock in at times, you know, without her and still have it be this very cohesive thing. Kind of in that in that Motown vein, right, where you've got, you know, a lead singer and then a group of, of harmony singers that, that are not necessarily starting and ending phrases, you know, in sync with the lead singer at times. Mm -hmm. And, and some of that of course was unintentional and, and, but, but it all worked out because Jamie and I, you know, have learned really kind of how to, how to think together. So that was, it was pretty cool to have sort of all of that happening in the moment, right. You know, I mean, it, it's, it's one of those things you can't really process it in the moment. And then afterwards you're like, Oh, right. There were, there were all these little things that, you know, this history that I've sort of explained here that's happened over time. And now it culminates in, in this, of course, the next gig will probably be a disaster. Cause we'll all go in thinking, well, we went that's in so underprepared, works. right. You know, we got you know, this, we got this. Yeah. Yeah. The only reason it worked was because we went in high alert, you know, like we haven't done this in a while, big ears, everybody's got to be paying attention. And if we don't do that the next time, then we're uh, potentially doomed. <laughs> but that there's a lesson there, right? Is always making sure you're you're a little bit uncomfortable on stage, right? There's I mean, there's there's way too uncomfortable and then there's also way too comfortable. And you got to with fling, I always have to find tricks to make us a little bit uncomfortable, like starting with a song that we know really well, but we haven't played in a while, you know, those kinds of things. Like if we've had good rehearsals leading up to a gig, it's like, all right, what can I do to shake it up for those first 10 minutes? Absolutely. You know what I'm saying? Like, well, I know and completely and actually think that's a leader thing. That's a, you know, it, it on an individual basis. Yes. Getting too comfortable. I mean, there, there's a difference between comfortable and, you know, kind of being in the groove. I mean, there's. Yes. Yes, of course. And, yes. and you need that also. You know, you need that kind of, you know, soft glove of of, uh, of, a, of a landing. And then you know that all your hard work is paying off when, when the music's sounding great and you're not having to work or think. that Those are good things to have. But I, as a leader, definitely. Um, and I do that with, you know, throwing in old songs. And, yeah. and uh, you know, I, I have taken to the last year or so letting the band know the set list ahead of time um, a few reasons one you know the horns who have these kind of uh, digital um uh sheet music 
Yep. Some of them have pads, some of them have other brands, but, um, you know, they can get theirs ordered and, you know, ready to go. But also, you know, we have, as a band, we probably have 250 songs now with Russ, we probably have a hundred songs that he's prepared on and, you know, picking from those and, you know, some of the stuff we've, we've eased into our best stuff for the summer that is making up 60 to 70%, but I'm trying to use that other 30 to 40% to just keep it interesting for us, you know, keep it interesting for the audience. You like what it does when the band rediscovers an old friend, you know, a song that we used to do that we hadn't done for a while. Yeah. That feels really rewarding, but, but, but that like that, that process of playing a song that you haven't done in a while can be, can be a very, a great way I find to start a gig sometimes, right? Cause everybody starts it thinking, okay, I have to pay attention. It's been a little while. Right. Even if you know the set list ahead of time, if you haven't rehearsed it as a band ahead of time, it's like, okay, we all need to like, did you, did you rehearse? Did you rehearse? Like, are we all on the mm. same page? We're all listening. But as, as long as it's successful, when you get to the end of that song, everybody's now at that level locked in together. And it's, to me, that paves the way for a great set of music most times. Sometimes well, it's a disaster, but. So I called uh, of this five gig stretch on gig four. I uh, put in some stuff that we haven't played in a long time. One of them, we really haven't played very much and it, it wasn't great. And I very consciously put it in on gig five and it was great on gig five. Uh -huh. And so, you know, yeah. and again, that's just, you know, my way of kind of like, you know, I'm not going to back off of something and expect oh that didn't go well. So we're just going to put it on the shelf for a while. I'm going to like insist that the guys pay attention, you know, and you know, you know, if you made a mistake, we, we didn't talk about it at, at the time in the gig and you just let it go. And, uh, but this is like my little subtle ways of like always trying to advance the ball, keeping the repertoire as wide and as fresh as possible. And so, um, I, I that's but that's that level of, uh, of discomfort that I think it is, is like, I'm sure everybody saw it and they're like, Hmm, Oh yeah. I haven't thought about this one in a while. All right, let's give it a try. And, and you know, that particular and other ones that we hadn't played for a while went like butter every time. So, right, so now I got I got to know what song. Uh, no, 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 I don't no, get to know. No, OK, no, 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 <laughs> no I got to no, ask, no. folks, I tried to do I, this for you. You know, just between you and I, it's a song we've talked about on the show in the past yeah. that has its own unique quirkiness. And uh, uh, it, you know, it's something that you just can't fake your way through. Sure. And uh, so anyway. <laughs> my band listens to this thing. So I'm hanging nobody out to dry. My brother. <laughs> got it. Got it. Well, you didn't, you didn't highlight anyone, which is why I felt comfortable at least asking the question. Yeah. I, I would never ask you to, to, you know, <laughs> we, but we have to live with our listeners, man. <laughs> Podcasts so, are not produced in a vacuum. Well, that's the thing, you know, my band listens to this. Your, your band listens to this. Definitely, We yeah. both have fans who listen to this. So when we talk about fans, it's, you know, and I think you and I do an interesting job. I mean, we, we're, we're fairly direct and transparent, Yeah. Um, but we're also thoughtful. I mean, we're not trying to, you know, embarrass anybody or reveal any dirty laundry. Cause again, when, when fans listen to this, that's an interesting parallel, you know, that we have to think about, right? Abs you I don't want to, yeah, you don't do. want to. To, to dispel the, I don't want to say illusion, but you, you don't want to, to, um, you don't want to taint anyone's view of your band just because, and, and there's some level of that that's bound to happen if you are a fan of, of a band and you get behind the curtain a little bit, right? You hear. Well, that's like, what they say. Yeah. My one friend who I, who I know listens to this, he said, it's, I was like, why is this interesting to you? And he's like, oh, no, no, it's like inside baseball. I mean, I love right. going to listen to music and it's totally interesting to me what you guys go through, which I thought was, I never thought that this show would appeal. Yes. Would appeal to a fan. I always thought it was to band people playing a band. But there's, but there's the risk that you'll start out a fan, you'll learn too much. And then, <laughs> well, and then you're like, you, you no longer can, can experience whatever that is that you're a fan of. You can't just experience it as someone who enjoys it. It's like, oh, look at that. Like those two guys, look at that. They're, they're like giving each other the stink eye. What's going on? <laughs> right. You, you know, you read too much into it and now suddenly, you know, you're, even though you're not in the band, you're in it. And, and that yeah. can be too much. And, and when we started this show, you know, I think this is the first time we've had this conversation publicly, you know, in, in a broadcast sense, but 
uh, you know, we we acknowledge that there are going to be some people that listen and it turns them off from, you know, the the reason that they started listening. Yeah. Now, they sure. might still be listeners, um, but in terms in terms of being, you know, fans and coming out to see the music, it's like, yeah, now you, you know too much. But for some people that deepens the relationship. Right. So it, it you know, it, it plays both ways and it's it, it does play. both. I ways. think you're right. Yeah. We're, we're both pretty thoughtful about it. And and uh if there is dirty laundry to be aired, I'm not going to give away any of our secrets here, but I will say that I think that you and I have managed that very well over the years. Well, we have. And and the reality is, is we we have some background in technology and, and, and media. And so we kind of, you know, if not this, I mean, there's Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and a lot of other ways that uh, a person seeking inside baseball type information could piece together their own yes. meaning for some of these things. Yes. There's a, um, a musician in my area who posted a oddly innocuous or not innocuous Facebook post about the important, it was, it, no names, but he just said loyalty is important to me is essentially what he said. I'm paraphrasing here. Sure. So obviously, you know, if you're a musician, you're all, like, what happened in his band? If you're a friend of his, you're like, I wonder if some friend, you know, w- was, you know, was disrespectful to him or something like that. And, you, you know, so, but it, my point is there are many ways that bands telegraph what's going on with their band. Not all of them do. Right. Um, uh, and, you know, musicians are emotional people. All right. And so yeah, and, you know, give and them often, an outlet to oftentimes uh, lacking some level <laughs> of maturity. <clears throat> that can happen too. Absolutely. I've, I've seen it. Yeah. I've seen it. Absolutely. So yeah, I think we've done a admirable job. I mean, for the comments I have, you know, I haven't pissed any one of my band off yet that I know of that, that they've let me know. I don't think I have, but, um, and I've you know, got the some emails fans, I should share with you. No, no, just kidding. Uh-oh, uh-oh. <laughs> no, 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 just kidding. <laughs> it's possible. Yeah, no, um, it, I don't have them. They won't share. Well, them I mean, but, you know, here's a, here's a net net of this thing. I probably wouldn't be doing this if it was, if it was just, uh, you know, me thinking I'm going to get a cathartic outlet to, yeah. you know, Offload. I mean, my band is good and we have fun and, you know, we're friends. I mean, we like I've been pretty frank here, like anybody you spend a lot of time with, you're going to you're going to cross streams with every once in a while. But 99 days out of 100, it's joy. And so and if it wasn't, I probably you wouldn't it would do be it. Too, yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, I wouldn't I would never throw a friend under the bus anyway. So um, if it was that type of thing, you know, this would not be the right outlet for it. So I think we framed it pretty well. And, you know, we go in knowing, you know, that it's out there and anybody can listen and anybody can interpret and anybody can comment and, yeah. you know, we, Feed, we've, feedback we've at gigabpodcast.com. Please yeah. let us know what you think, because this is, this is interesting. It, it, yeah. It's interesting to us to hear what you think about all of it, but especially like this last little sort of tangential segment we had here. This is yeah. it's good. We, uh, yeah. we took a jog out to the left. There. We did. Yeah. But it keeps it interesting. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Hey, I want to tell you about my my little run of gigs here. So Yeah, man. I don't think my band has ever done 5 nights in a row. Oh. I I was thinking back and I don't think we have. So I want to talk a little bit about it because uh it was an interesting run. It was very successful. It was very it was very productive. I have an I have an optic into what we just went through as a leader. I'm sure the guys have an optic of what we went through. I mean, again, it's just five gigs. It's not like we, you know, we're digging a coal mine or anything like that. But um, we started out Wednesday with that a, is that is important to remember. You know, yes, when, when these playing. gigs these gigs feel <laughs> grueling and all that. You, you know, and and as my friend <laughs> Brandon likes to say, he's the the director of of Madhouse and many other things that I've done. He was also he and his his partner they're the Mad Men of Oopsie Daisy Inc. And he direct, they directed Tommy and many other things I've done. And I work really well with him. But as, as Brandon likes to say, you know, we're adults doing play pretend here. Yes. It's like it. it we, yes, we act like this is really important and it's good that we act like this is important. But the reality is if somebody makes a mistake, we're not saving lives. It's Nobody okay. dies. Yeah. Nobody dies. You know, <clears throat> like none of us are making enough money for this. Like really, I mean, you know, we enjoy the money, but okay. You know, like, yeah. Springsteen says that it's called playing music, not working music. Right. Yeah. We play music. Yeah. Exactly. So anyway, with that in mind, you know, we started five days. The first one was uh, at the beach, actually a, a band, a, a band shell right at the beach <clears throat> in the town of Santa Cruz. 
which is a great music town, Capitola, California. Yep. Uh, great. It's just a great music scene over there. They appreciate different types of music. They, you know, people of all ages, the music venues over there are really vibrant and really cool. And this was a, a community concert series at the beach. Great crowd comes out for it. They come out early. They really are into it from the downbeat on. We get to play a fish tune because fish and the Grateful Dead are huge over there. And, yeah. and uh, you know, it was just really fun. Again, it was when we play at the beach over here, so I don't know how, how, what the weather is like at the ocean over there, but here the summer is typically the worst time at the beach. The fall is the nicest time, oh. but, but the summer can get really cold. But for all the years we've been playing, we've had amazing luck. We had one gig when we loaded in, it was 80 degrees on the beach. Beautiful. But the fog was out there and over the two hours from load in to downbeat, it went down to about 60 degrees oh. and it was just, yeah, really crazy. We were freezing, but, but this was, this was a good gig. It was actually very warm. And, uh, the first half hour, 45 minutes was in direct sun and it was, you know, and it was setting right in front of us. And so there was no hiding from it. So the whole band was in it and weather will be a continuing theme of my conversation here. But anyway, uh, great gig, great audience participation. I want to interject here that one of the most rewarding things that I'm so loving doing with my band now is of all songs, twist and shout. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, I'll tell you, well, here's the deal. It's a fun one to play. Well, here's that's it. I mean, people, everyone dances to it. Mm -hmm. Everyone sings to it. Everybody puts their hands in the air to it. I can go in about 75 different directions and there's three chords. The band's just the band, you know, right. little changes and feel all these types of things. It is such an incredibly creatively expressive thing and audience interaction expressive thing. It is, it is just the funnest thing that I'm doing right now, the sound from the band that, you know, even the intuition with the horns, the audience connection to have just having fun. And, and at the end of this gig, now we've been ending our shows all summer with uh, love train by the OJs. Oh, nice. And uh, yeah. And it, and it's great. And a woman came up after the show. She goes, just thank you so much for the uplifting music. We in this world need that so much. And I could not think of a nicer compliment than that. I mean, it was, it was just so cool. And so looking back at, at videos of, of people, you know, with twist and shout and people of all ages are smiling and to some people it's a little bit of a goof, but that's okay. You know, it's, that song has served its purpose so well for so long. Some little kids seeing their parents having that much fun is just awesome. Uh, people who don't dance, dance to it. And it's just, to me, it's just a very thrilling like I said, audience expressive thing to connect with people, get them singing along, call and response. Just, it's just wonderful. And so that I had an experience with that at Capitola that, you know, kind of kicked off the weekend for me. And it was just fantastic. Do you ever play Twist and Shout anymore? I have played it. Uh, I don't play it actively in any of the bands that I'm in. Like I, I wouldn't say that it's on the set list. Uh, it's probably been a number of years since I played it. In fact, it's possible the last time I played it was with you. I think we used to we used to pull it out definitely uh, at at all star band gigs. But um, yeah, it's a I mean it's fun and the nice part about like I I was thinking I've got a gig with Uptown this weekend and it's like you know we could throw that song in like like you said it everybody knows the tune it doesn't like you, you don't need you just need you just need to agree which person is singing it and follow that person and yeah. the rest is is butter. And, and if you have a rough little corner here or there, it doesn't matter because the crowd is totally on your side from note one, you know, from yeah. note one. And yeah. it's interesting when you play with musicians, it's I know intuitively that the other people on stage will figure out the harmony build. That's I mean, it, it just it, it always happens. It never not happens. Right. 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 Everybody knows the song. It's in every rock and roll fans DNA. It's just it's just part of the deal. And so, you know, it's uh it's been a lot of fun for me. And again, the band sounds great on it. You know, we, we had a nice horns part to it and, and uh, there's some improvised stretch to it. And so it's just, it's been really cool. And that's it's right. just, you know, to me, that's the rock and roll national anthem. Some people would say Johnny be good. I would say twist and shout. What do you think? Oh, the rock and roll national anthem. Uh, what would that be? Those two are definitely good contenders. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think. Is there anything else? Is 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 you know, Sweet Home Alabama on that list? Maybe. 
Might be too new, though. Maybe. I mean, it's not a new song by not any new. stretch. But, <laughs> but your old song. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, th- th- those those are on the list. I mean, is there, you know, is is Jailhouse Rock on that list? Maybe. Could be. Could be. But yeah, yeah, that's that's certainly, huh. Yeah, I like it. Jailhouse right, Rock, you so, can't. Jailhouse, I, I think to be the national anthem, it needs to be playable by any band at any time, anywhere. And and so I feel like Jailhouse Rock, you probably need to rehearse a little bit. That Yeah. To and get there's that, also. To get that right. You know, there's yeah. Elvis and then there's the Blues Brothers version. There's a few different things going on. Yeah. I mean, um, there's there's Mustang Sally. That that I, uh, well, that would that would actually be in there. Right. So that that yeah. that certainly trumps Jailhouse Rock. So there's your three. Right. You've got yeah, there you, you go. You've got Johnny Be Good, <laughs> Twist and Shout and Mustang Sally. Yeah. So the other thing about this gig at the at the shore was that um, they provided sound. Now we have a bill, and the the legend of Bill grows over the course of this five show run, <laughs> of course. and his importance and value to us. So Bill does advanced stuff for us. So he'll call the sound companies, make sure they understand our our our, our uh, stage plot, find, sees if he can bring anything. You know, you know, feels them out for how. Um, how, whether they'll let him mix, um, yep. you know, or, or create consternation week. if he insists on mixing, yep. um, you know, whether he can, you know, do monitors or, you know, front house. Anyway, this is interesting. The guy was um, a fairly, no, he was a very experienced sound guy and he had really good gear, really good gear. Um, but all of us had strange starting point EQs for everyone. I mean, our, like our sax player said, he's making my sax sound like, sound like a jazz sax, that there was just no, no cut to it. No bite, All the yeah. vocals sounded weird. My, my guitar, and he had really expensive mics, you know, on the amps and stuff like that. But again, not to delve too far into it, but when dealing with someone else, this is a possibility, oh, right? It happens you know, all the time. Yeah. All the time. And, and, so, and I will say this, um, I haven't really talked much about this, but um, since I did that gig at the beach, down in Hampton, or, you know, a couple months ago, um, I, we had a sound guy that that mixed that front of house, and he changed the EQ on on everything uh, mm-hmm. to make it sound good in the mains, which is fu- I mean, understandable. Um, he added a lot to the bass at a point where I could not make a change to my in ear mix, and I've had a, a an extra little ring in my right ear ever since then. Ooh, yep. Bad. So this is. It like it's a really important thing to to have to make sure the engineer understands that if you've got people on in ears, this is my little PSA here, that the engineer understands that every change that they make to the gain structure of that channel that's beyond the fader and the pan, you know, is going to impact the monitors and specifically people's ears yeah 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 so anyway that's my ps i didn't mean to bring us down here but no no, no important that's good to remember so, yeah so then we go to night two which is um, another co- you know, community concert series beautiful park up in moraga california and we played this many years and bill has a relationship with the um contracted sound company and with that um bill brings our board he also brings our monitors and basically he just sends the guy a house left and a house right sure yeah. Okay. Right. Yep. But we have more control. And again, we are extremely comfortable and, you know, it, it, it was a really pleasant night. It's not a concert where traditionally that many people get up and dance. And, you know, we had the conversation about is dancing the, the scorecard that one, we kind of go in knowing that people more picnic and have family time, but for whatever reason, and I don't, not for whatever reason, I think our show actually has a different vibe to it this year. We got many more people up and involved in the show. Nice. So night, night two was a good one, right? Night three was another concert series in Santa Clara, California. Um, really great energy again from the beginning. A lot of local people who know us come out to it and we kind of cruise that. Although again, contracted sound company, he's one of those guys who has his way of doing things. Um, uh, you know, Nick is like, he studied sound engineering and he's very good at getting specifically what he wants, you know, frequency by frequency in his he, mix. He and knows his what structure. to ask for. Yeah. He knows what to ask for. I am not that. And so, you know, having a bill is, is particularly important to me. So, but you know, again, great energy, you know, sometimes when you start, although here's a funny thing, um, all these gigs were starting in pretty high sunlight. I haven't seen a light on my pedal board in a long time. Nick couldn't see the light, 
uh, on his keyboard and he was going to change a patch and all of a sudden nothing was coming out oh. and on the first song too. And so in the first 10 seconds of the first song. And, uh, so all of a sudden, you know, we didn't know where the power went out or what, what the heck was going on, but, uh, we recovered and then we just went on, um, night four. So we've had three good gigs in a row and we're feeling good night four. We're on a huge stage at an event center at a winery. Uh, but it was one of those things where the event had been going on since two in the afternoon. Oh. It's not about the music. Right. For some people it is, but yeah, maybe a yeah. third of the people it is. Um, and even when we start, they're still eating dinner and, and that type of thing. Uh, and it was the first kind of cognizant reflection that not everything goes right for you all the time. So, you know, you start the, there's a sizable dance floor and then a tent that all the people eating dinner are under the tent and we're on the other side of the dance floor on a stage. And, uh, it took a while to get people out there. And actually through all night, it was, um, it was never that level of huge connection that we'd been experiencing the other three days. It was, it was not bad and we didn't play badly, but, um, you know, you kind of get rolling and you start feeling like you, you, you will own every stage you go on to. And it's for a number of reasons, it's good to have a humbling moment every now and then. It absolutely and, is. And, and that's, that's really my point. And you don't get to predict when those happen, just like you don't necessarily get to predict when you can walk in and and it is like butter. I mean, it's it's you know, you have those moments where it's like, wow, we can do no wrong. Like, yep. you know, that's not all of the moments, though. So, yep. right. Well, well, this brings me to, to day five. So day five was a uh, so we played we played till nine thirty the night before. And it was an 11, 12 o'clock call the next morning for a one thirty downbeat, one thirty to four thirty. Um, backing up to the, to the fourth gig, they were really nice to us. I mean, they fed us great. They gave us a beautiful green room and it was really comfortable. It was just that kind of cognizance that don't take anything for granted. Yeah. I mean, and it's, a, it's an interesting thing because you've had three good gigs and then you got to kind of process why is it happening this way? Yes. They're very far away from us to get out the dance floor. Yes. They've been here since two 30 in the afternoon doing other activities, some of them are leaving after dinner. They weren't here for the music anyway. But, you know, you think you deserve to go over every night. And then the question is, what levers do you throw to make yourself go over? Or do you just go with your same plan that's been working for you in other ways? All these things are kind of going through your head. And again, we played well, very well. Those who were there, you know, were ext extremely enthusiastic and complimentary. That's kind of cool. But many people just stayed back in their tables and had social time and, you know, that's not really a reflection of us, but it sure feels like I want to make it a reflection. Like if we really were all that, I think we are, we would, those people would bow to my will. And, you know, right. <laughs> so this is an interesting thing. And, and, you know, I mean, we're, we talked about this kind of at the beginning of the episode too, where you said uh, that it's the band leader's job. Well, it's also the responsibility that falls on the band leader's shoulders. Right. When, and when you can walk into a room and it's, you know, it's just perfect butter from note one. You feel like you can do no wrong. I, you know, the band just it expects that. Right. And then when you when you get to a place where it's not going well, even if the band isn't looking at you as the you know, either. I mean, there's many different ways, you know, bands can be organized. But generally speaking on stage, it usually is one person. It should be one person that, that sort of takes the reins. And when it's not going well and you are that person on stage, it can feel very lonely. Mm. You, you know, like, oh, man, like, you know, the band's playing well. I can't blame these guys. You know, the, the crowd's not responding. They're looking to me to call the right song and, and navigate us the right way to sure. get this to a place where the energy is flowing back and forth. And, and that can be, like I said, it can feel very lonely, like, oh, crap, like, what am I going to do next? What am I going to do next? And, and if the, if, if you are, if your band is organized such that you are that person, or there is just one person it, in those moments, especially rarely does it make sense for that person to turn and say, anybody else got any ideas, you know, like, because it, it, I mean, you can do that, but don't expect people that haven't been doing this for that band for every other gig to be the ones to have a genius idea. They might, and it's never a bad idea to, you know, sort of solicit that feedback at, at the right times. 
But I, I guess I, I just wanted to acknowledge that that can be a that can be a stressful scenario. It can add more stress to the scenario. And I, and I say this knowing that I add that stress myself. You know, when I've had this conversation with, you know, like we'll talk about, we'll debrief a gig with Fling, and I'll be like, yeah, I don't know, you know, during that second set or what, I just couldn't pull it together. And everybody's like, what are you talking about? I'm like, well, I'll just call the right songs. They're like, man, sometimes it, that's just how it goes, you know. And you're like, oh, right, these guys weren't, you know. Yes, they they. I'm the one that has that job, but you know, they're, they're not looking at this as a failure. They understand that this kind of, that's how it goes. And so, I don't yeah, know. we tried to call a couple of audibles. We yeah. tried to interact with the audience a little bit. I and mean, we tried the things that are typically in our bag. And I think in yeah. my group and I, from what I understand about fling, if someone had a great idea, they would throw out a great idea. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, they would try. Absolutely. And so yeah, yeah. I, I feel the most responsibility to try those types of things. That's and I think it. the you guys feel defer the most, to me. The most responsibility. There you go. Yeah. And I would just say that the uh, coming out of the gig, it was just um, deflating is the first word that comes to mind. But again, we didn't play poorly, so it's not that. But again, you're aware that you got to earn it every night. Like even though the past three nights were great and we were essentially doing the same thing, there is the moment, that moment that is different from the previous moment that you got to figure out every time. Yep. It's, it's a gift if, if what you've done the previous moment continues to work, but it's not a guaranteed thing as a thing. And so there were a couple lessons to learn in there. You know, I, I, I can't sit here right now and say to you what I would, like I said, we tried to mix some stuff up when we got the momentum going and we had a slow song coming on the set list. We, we punted that till the end and, and uh, you know, we did a few things and, those that were there. And again, I think it's fair to say sometimes you just got to take what the defense will give you. Sometimes the crowd has been there since two 30. Sometimes, sometimes it's not really a music event. You're just the added music. Uh, and did you make those who were paying attention happy? I mean, again, you know, this is a, a kaleidoscopic view into the problem, right? It's not. Oh no, it, this it, is, know. this is just what we were just talking about. Like now you get to, this is so super inside baseball. That's right. It's yep. Yeah. I, I always feel bad in those moments, like when the gig isn't going well and you make a decision, like you said, cut the slow song or, you know, whatever. Like there's the songs that for whatever reason, correct or incorrect in your mind as the decision maker of the moment, uh, you know that this is the wrong song, even if you're wrong. Right. You know, and I will say this three years later, Uptown Funk is still the best. No, no. No question about it. Gets people will work every butts. time. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. It is the king of dance music. I don't, you know, whatever it was before, I don't know, but, but, uh, it, it was celebration. That, that, um, that, uh, say what you are, the thing that, uh, oh gosh, what was the, the, I can't even think of the name of the, the band, but anyway, there was something right before Uptown Funk and it's gone now because it's irrelevant. Nobody, nobody cares. There you go. Well, yep. Uptown Funk is the king right now. It is. It's, again, it's a three-year-old song. So there've been many contenders since then. That's right. Contenders from Bruno, but, but, uh, that, that song works. That's the and, one. And then but you get a little glimmer of hope. And then, and then the weird thing is, even if you have a strong song after it, when people walk off the dance floor after oh, that, that sucks. <laughs> You're like, what? what it, Come wait, back. we earned you. We earned you. No, Bruno you earned him. Like, you just tapped into it for a brief true. moment. You know, Very true. I always feel bad, though, when I when I cut that song out that that might be, you know, the song that, you know, one band member or another was either looking forward to playing or it's, you know, one of the few songs they sing or whatever. And I always feel bad cutting that out. And I feel especially worse at the end of the night when I realized I cut that song and you know what? It didn't matter what we did. We yep. didn't have those people anyway. I could have at least made you happy as opposed to, you know, whatever. Absolutely. Yeah, that, so and this, that's, it sucks being in that So this position. brings me to day five. So okay. All right. So day five is um, a 130 downbeat at a country club. Um, it's a golf club. Um, they've had a concert series, a Sunday afternoon concert series. We played for them a couple of years ago. And not that much interest, you know, they're a handful of people, right? Yeah. But they've continued on with it and they moved it from a Thursday night or something like that to a Sunday afternoon. First thing is the size that they put us on, they said they could only give us a certain size stage. Sure. And that size stage is the only thing that they could cover. So basically we had to reconfigure our band. It was like a clown car and Simon and I are on the floor in front of the stage for this one. 
Well, so, at least you don't have to worry about falling if you uh, climb up to your post. Nice on stage. Day. Nice. You're Thank welcome. you very much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll be here all week. Um, yeah. Um, but we were in the direct sun. And actually, fairly enough, the, the sun, as it was setting, you know, having something over the top of you didn't help as the sun was. Yeah, taking it needs an angle, to be right? off to the side. Right. Yep. And I would say this, I was deflated enough from Thursday night that I wasn't, I wasn't conscious. And then we got to the gig and all of a sudden, so this is truly inside baseball. Can my wife have a, have a meal ticket? It, it, there was unlimited drinks and, and, you know, the guys, one guy was getting drinks and giving it to his significant other. And I had to say, you know, dude, that's not, that's kind of taken advantage of. We shouldn't do that. And, you know, cause I want the, I want to keep my relationship with the booking person, yeah, absolutely, you know, absolutely. cool. Right. And it was like, you know, dude, it's hot. I want to wear shorts, dude, you know, this, do this. And all of a sudden it was like four days of, you know, constant. And, <laughs> and I was, I was, I was tense as it was from an average experience the night before and a bunch of things just started and, and you know oh you know everybody oh it's gonna be hot and you know so the band was kind of grumpy and i'm going through a thought process is like well this is the result of five days right you know everybody's tired everybody's worked hard you know this is this is what happens when you do five days in a row of gigs is that yeah. people are gonna you know by the fifth day you're gonna be a little burned out and and little little social norms that might not have happened on day one might creep out on day five as a result of being tired and i'm trying to intellectualize that but it still doesn't it's not very satisfying you know it's like can we just get through this gig and play a good gig and get back to work and you know be focused on that type of thing so we proceed with the gig and we actually had a, a good crowd and the band was playing really well. And again, Bill who got there early, set us up in hot sun. There was no place for him out of the sun. Oh. And so, you know, and he just, you know, and, and again, I just got to take another left turn here. Not only does he never complain, he gets there early. He, he, he brings us scented towels, man, cold ice dipped towels. Nice. I mean, he, he is, the most remarkable part. We could not do what we do if it wasn't for this guy. And on a day where grouchiness could have taken a turn, the amount that he worked mm. set a standard for all of us to shut up and just, you know, enjoy the ride yeah, because he's the it, one who's man. had it hard. He's the one. Again, Simon and I were in the direct sun. I'm not as sensitive to it, so it doesn't bug me. There was a one point in time late in the show when it was late afternoon sun. It was pretty hot. I looked over Simon and he, you know, he was doing a little bit of a self-adjustment to make sure he was okay. Right. Oh, had to yeah. take some water. That's everything. Yeah. But, uh, we actually got a very, very good reaction from the audience that was there and a lot of kudos and they served us a nice lunch. And then you start to add up the, the sum, especially as we got to the third set of this gig and everybody was like, dude, we're about to finish five out of five. We've worked our butts off this oh, week. And there was a certain yeah. sense of so that, you know, that whole that roller coaster, yeah. yeah, it comes all the way around. And as we went into that last, you know, everybody's giving high fives. And then when we, you know, we finished the song and it, we got an encore and people really liked it. And I think everybody had a sense of we've gone through this thing. And I'm not saying that all the guys felt exactly where I was coming into the last gig. I'm just telling you how I was feeling. Um, but uh, uh, there was a sense coming out at the end that that's a pretty cool thing. You know, you, you have your boys boys and girls, you have your boys, you go in, you're, you are committed to serving your audience and giving them a good time. You do everything you can. It'll often go well if you've done your homework. If it doesn't go as well as you have, you have to kind of like figure out what to do with it. Everybody, do you put it aside and say, that's the situation? Did you do something that you can improve and then improve it tomorrow? Because that moment is gone. You can't get that moment back. And then, then there's the last one. And then you kind of take stock of all the things that you've done, all the preparation you've done. We played a lot of songs over the course of the five days and we yeah, went pretty man. deep into our catalog. The playing was, was exceptional all through the time. And you just, I think you grow together certainly musically. And then you kind of have that shared crisis, hot days, you know, people asking for stuff, you know, audiences, frowning when you play a slow song when they're just getting ready to go fat you know all the all the all the data that you have that's coming in and you figure out what to do but at the end it felt like you know we we went on a long trip together 
and we came home in good shape. And uh, well, and you got you you had the benefit of your the low point not being the final show too. Yeah, right? you got you got to come up out of it. I mean, if those last two gigs were reversed, that it, you you may be telling a very different story right now. You, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. and and you need that perspective. Like we always say here, the the beauty of live art is you always have the next moment. Right. If the previous Truth. one didn't go well, but if the previous one did go well, well, you always have the next moment too. you know, you don't just get to rest on those particular laurels for the rest of your life. You That's go true. and play the next moment. And the hope is that you can make it better or as good or different in a good way or whatever that is. But it's never a guarantee. And, th- and I mean, it's that 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 we love. I have um, I've really done it to myself this this weekend, Paul. I've got. I've got a gig Thursday that's an acoustic gig with Monkey Fist, but it's a four hour acoustic gig, which is mm. long. Yeah. That's long. It's at the gaslight in Portsmouth. Yeah. It's always fun. I mean, it's a blast. It it actually gets more full and more energetic as the as the the our time slot progresses. It's it's a seven to eleven gig. And so so it's it it'll be good. We'll have fun. And then uh Friday night, I think I'm not gonna I, there's a there's another monkey fist gig. Uh, about an hour away that I could do with him, but I don't think I can make it because I'm doing a midnight performance of Rocky horror that night. <laughs> and then Saturday I have a wedding all day in Portsmouth and they had asked me to also do the midnight performance of Rocky horror on Saturday nights, Sunday morning. And I was like, well, I don't know. And then it turns out this wedding that uptown's playing in Portsmouth is like literally at the place where I park my car to go to the theater where we play Rocky Horror. So it's like, well, there's already drums at the theater. I'm already going to be right there. Our gig ends, our set ends at 1015. And so I've got to put my drums, pack up, put my drums in the car and then uh, just kind of walk across the street, maybe change my clothes, maybe not. Who knows? Who cares? Right. It's Rocky Horror. And, um, and, and go play that gig. So I'm doing that too. So I've got, what's that? One, two, three, four gigs in, in two 48 days. hours. Yeah. Something yeah. like that. Yeah. Yeah. 40, maybe 50 hours by the time all is said and done. Yeah. 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 Oh, and we're moving my daughter into college in the middle there <laughs> somewhere. So I, I, and, and, and that part of it was not lost on me. It was like, okay, I know I'm going to be, you know, I, I need some level of distraction after we do that. So like that, that was sort of factoring into my brain as I was booking all these gigs together and trying to create this puzzle. It's like, yeah, we'll drop her off. And then, and, and my wife is, uh, ushering the two Rocky horse. So we'll be there at both of those together, which is good. You know? So, cool. yeah, it'll be, uh, it'll be crazy, but you know, the, 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 I don't get the benefit of shared crisis with any of this, right? Because the, the people that I'm doing each gig with, uh, potentially may only be doing that gig, or at least with Rocky horror, it's the two, you know, two nights in a row. So I'll right. end it with some shared crisis, but the other ones, especially the uptown gig, like I can't, I can't get there and moan about, well, I was, you know, just here, you know, seven hours ago or whatever, now that we're setting up for this wedding. And, you know, if, if I want to complain about being tired, those are not the guys to complain to, you know, yeah, <laughs> like just suck, sure. it, suck it up, buttercup. Let's go. Yep. <laughs> yep. You, sure. you had our gig first. You took these others around it. Make sure you show up and play like, you know, like this is the most important thing for you to do at this moment. So, yep. <laughs> Keeps it interesting though. Right. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. 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 So, all right, man. Yeah. You got anything else going uh, this weekend? Lots of gigs for you. So I'm starting um, rehearsals. I'm the guitar player in a band that my friend Mary Ellen has put together to do a, a special tribute to Linda Ronstadt. That's her idol. Oh. And so she's put together a really killer band. Um, all aspects of Ronstadt's career. So going back to the Stone Ponies all the way, you know, wow. through the, the Nelson Riddle stuff. And um, so we're, we start rehearsing that tonight um so i've had to find time to woodshed the first half of the show so so the way that she's done it is uh you know she gave everybody the song list a month ago and tonight's the rehearsal for the first half then there's a rehearsal for the second half and then there's a dress rehearsal for the whole show and that's pretty much it and so um amongst all of this other stuff i'm trying to do you know obviously i put off Really, I, you know, I became familiar with it. whatever I wasn't familiar with. I became more familiar with over the last couple weeks and then really started digging into it in the last seven to 10 days. And so I got that tonight. House Rockers have a big gig coming up in a couple of weeks and we're going to add five songs. Three of them we're bringing back 
from that Russ has never played with us, but the band hasn't played in a long time. Sure. And then two new songs because we have this big kick gig coming up on September 1st and uh, it's a, like an end of summer party that we kind of host. And uh, so we're going to put five new songs into the repertoire for that. Um, we have a ticketed show on fr- Saturday night. Oh. So um, uh, I've been advertising for it amongst all the busyness and all the opportunities to see us play for free. We're about to find out if people will buy a ticket to see us, it's plays, you know, we don't play in this area terribly much. We have some history there. I've taken a lot of Facebook advertising out and really been calling in, uh, you know, everyone I know who lives in this area to spread the word, find out if there's birthday parties. I'm curious. You know? I'm curious how that, how that'll work out for you, both in terms of like how you're able to draw in that area. And then are you able to draw people that from, you know, other areas that, have been seeing you, like you said, for free every week for the last so, X number of weeks. That, that'll well, be here's curious. the deal. My yeah. premise is this. I live in a pretty affluent area. The cost to come in and see us is not going to break or, you know, sure. it, 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 it's a little bit more than a single craft cocktail. Right. Um, so I, my premise is that the cost is not the barrier. Right. Um, but um, it's not an area where we, where is, is, the center of our fan base where there's the huge pool. We have some, you know, history and some fan base there, but we need some things to go well and we need a little bit of reputation to spread and we need the advertising to get out. So I actually have, I have that show, which is a ticketed show. Then we have another ticketed show in about three weeks in another area, far from this area that, that uh, I have to figure out. Then we have, um, we announced um, a concert series. We're going to be doing the, the, the winery that we played at, on Saturday night is beautiful event center. We're going to do ticketed shows there largely instead of club dates next year. Smart. So we're going to be very selective if we take a club date because, you know, I worked out a pretty good copacetic win-win deal with this winery and, um, and we're going to do ticketed shows at the winery and they're going to sell a lot of wine and we're going to sell a lot of, you know, dance tickets. And then, um, and then we're going to announce a, a Halloween gig, really soon. And so I've got a lot of ticketed stuff. And so it's, it's, I'm aware it's interesting that my life is moving there where, where if I want my band to get paid outside of corporate and casuals and private gigs, you know, our standard path through club dates has got to get better. And this is our path to that. But we, we, we happen to have quite a few of them in the next two months, which is a lot. And so, like I said, if, if we're starting with our core base, you know, 20 miles around where we are, where I live, um, you know, they're not going to go to all of them. They might go to two of them. They'll likely right. go to one of them. Right. And right. does that mean all of them will fail <laughs> or, or one of them will be really successful or, you know, it'll be interesting to see. Yeah, that's um, yeah. I'm I, Like I said, I'm really curious to hear about this. That's that because that is the the way to evolve it. Right. And, and you get to control a little bit, a lot more of the. Uh, well, of the experience of the gig, but it is a hundred percent up to you to, you know, to, to take point on drawing people there and all that. So, yep. Yeah. So we'll see how it goes. Yeah. Very interesting. Always interesting. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Well, that's good because it means it'll give us uh, more stories and more to talk about here. And that's what, that's where you folks come in. Please do let us know, right? GigGabPodcast.com. Feedback at GigGabPodcast.com. You can find us there. You can find us, of course, on Facebook and uh, wherever you find us. Say hi. We like to hear from you. We want to know what what you like, what you don't like, and tell your friends about the show, too. So that's what I got, man. You got anything else? Or are we uh, All good stuff, man. It's all good. Yeah. All right. Well, that's... Uh, that's where we're taking it from this time. Oh, wait. Are you sure you don't have anything else, Paul? Oh, I got something. Do you? Just maybe one last thing? Three words? Even maybe? on your fourth out of five when it's not going your way, always, always. be performing. Always. Bear that in mind. Bear. Bear.